I love Anita Renfro. She cracks me up. Hilarious. I actually was on an airplane. Um, this is probably maybe two or three years ago. Jeff and I were flying to Omaha to do a marriage conference at a church. And I, I, we had actually gotten upgraded to first class, and, uh, which is always like, whoa, whenever that happens. And, um, and so we sit down in first class. And you know how when you get a ch sense that somebody is avoiding your eyes? You know, like you look at somebody and you glance away and you just notice that the person goes like this? And, and so I was looking, I was trying to put my stuff down, and I see this brown head um, going like this. And I finally went, Anita? And she was like, I didn't want you to see me without makeup. <laughs> like, you're insane, girl. All right. Um, how many of you have been there, by the way? It's like run into somebody. It's like I really did not want them to see me without makeup. Um, all right. So speaking of stress, anyway, um, speaking of real stress, we talked earlier about the fact that so often the stress that we have in our lives, it does not have to be there, OK? that so often we are operating contrary to how we're designed or maybe contrary to how men are designed, right? Because we talked about both angles. And we don't realize it. Now, we're going to be talking about that in this session. But I also want to acknowledge that's not the only reason for the stress that we face. I mean, we are underground espionage agents, right? We're going to get shot at. We're living in a fallen world. And sometimes we are facing immense stress because of other people's poor choices, because of the brokenness of this world. That is inevitable in, unfortunately, in this world that we're living in, in these shadow lands. However, that said, there are so many ways that actually so much of that sense of stress, any sense that we have of a lack of peace, any sense that we have a lack of rest, so often that is coming not because of some of those other factors, but because of the fact that we're operating, operating contrary to how we're designed. Now, we are going to be diving in in this session specifically into what the Bible says about how we are designed and using it as a compass, so to speak, um, when I uh, was in um, college, my all three of my college summers, I worked on a at a dude ranch in the Colorado Rockies, and um, and it was awesome. It was a bunch of you know college age young people in this amazing area, you know, up way up in the Rocky Mountains. And every now and then, if we had a day off, which we didn't very often. But if we had a day off, we'd go out hiking, we'd do you know, all these things that you do when you have this amazing opportunity. And there was one time that we got completely 100% legit lost. How many of you have ever been legitimately lost? It's probably not going to be a very, oh, it is a large number, OK. And I'm not talking like legit lost, like, OK, I'm going to have to consult my GPS on my phone to figure out which way to turn, right? It's scary <laughs> to actually be lost. My sense, I'm pretty good with directions. My sense was that the ranch, which is where we were heading back to, the ranch was downhill and to the right. And so I was really convinced that this was the way that we should go because I, was, I really felt that strongly. Um, but turned out somebody in our party discovered that they had a compass. And the compass said the way that we should go was actually pretty much straight ahead and even a little bit to the left. Which way did we go? You follow the compass. You don't follow your feelings. We have to treat the Bible the same way when it comes to guidance on some of these questions that we're going to be asking, like, how do we get to that place 
that where we really are thriving in this crazy world, there are going to be times that our feelings, doggone it, tell us to go this way. This is what we want to do. This is what we feel like. And yet the compass says to do this, which way are we going to go? If we want to get to God's best for us, where we really are going to thrive, we have to get used to the idea that sometimes it's going to mean setting aside our feelings. So let's talk about if, if, um, if we have this idea of that we're all designed for a purpose, let's put an analogy in here to talk about how we're designed. Every created thing has a purpose behind its creation and it has design specifications. Ways that it's supposed to work and not supposed to work, right? So the creator created for a purpose and gave it certain design specs that's supposed to work and not supposed to work. Every created thing has that. Your cell phones, the chairs you're sitting on, the electronics back there, everything has that. And so do we. If you tend to use your things in the way that they're designed to work, they will tend to work. If you tend to use them in a way that they're not designed for, for a purpose they're not designed for, in ways they're not designed for, they're going to tend to break. And we're the same. Let me give you an analogy of this. So we, I live in Atlanta, and um, a number of years ago, we had this weird period. I don't really know why, but it was like it rained. It would not stop raining. It was like three, four weeks, constantly. And I know you guys in California would love that, right? Um, oh, you've had that? Okay. <laughs> all right, you guys are like, no, you already had that. Um, well, it's interesting. This, this particular season, this, this three, four, five week period in Atlanta, it was so weird. I mean, it was weird that the, literally the DJs on the secular radio stations were saying, I'm kind of expecting to see the animals come two by two. Like, it was, <laughs> it was weird. So, and one of the problems when it rains in our neighborhood, in our area, is that we are the last little subdivision. There's t um, miles and miles of subdivisions in this one area of suburban Atlanta. And then you go down a little dip, you cross the stream, and you come out the other end, and that's you're suddenly in the commercial areas where, you know, you have the grocery stores and all the other stuff, right? We're the last subdivision. And the problem is, is that when it rains so much, that little stream overflows, it washes across the road, and the police have to close the road because it's not safe to, you know, drive across because it's now become a river, right? And the problem is, I can see the grocery store. Like, I can just, it's right there. And I have to drive 20 minutes out of my way to get back to where I can see right there. So one of these nights, crazy rain, and it was starting to be like, okay, this is going to happen again. There's no hot food in the house. Okay, let me just run out to the grocery store before the road closes. So I start, I drive over the road, and as I do, I see, you know, it's just a little bit of water. It hasn't really flooded it yet. There's no police around, and <laughs> which is, you know, what it counts. And um, <laughs> I shouldn't say that as a Christian. I'm sorry, you know, but, um, but, you know, I could get there. And so I ran in. I shopped really quickly. And as I came back out, I'm in my minivan, and as I come back out, I see that the, ro the, the water has really gotten quite a bit higher, but it looks okay. It's, it looks like it's about, like from here to maybe that thing. It looks like it's not very wide, and it looks like it's about maybe that deep. <coughs> and so I'm sitting there in my minivan, and I'm like, I can see my house, right? And you know what I'm thinking as I'm doing this? You know what I'm thinking, right? I can make it. <laughs> right? So I start driving across, and as I'm driving, I realize it's a lot further across than I thought it was. And I'm going, okay. And then I'm like, it's a lot deeper than I thought it was. Instead of being this deep, it's more like this deep. And I'm like, okay, okay. And I can tell that the water is rising up on the side of my car, on the side of my minivan. I'm like, ha, ah, ah. ha. And I get right to the center. 
and I hear the worst sound in the world, ka-chunk, and the van cuts out. I'm like, oh, okay, turn it off, turn it back on, nothing. Turn it off, turn it back on, nothing. And then the van starts to float. <laughs> and it settles, and I am out of that van and in the water, right? Because I was scared, right? I'm in the water. Now, ruining my best speaking shoes in the process, by the way. <laughs> Only another woman gets what a tragedy that is. The guys are like, what? You know. <clears throat> but I was safe but my van was totaled. It turns out it was not designed to be used as an amphibious vehicle. <laughs> Sometimes we feel like our life has been totaled. Sometimes we feel like our relationships have been totaled. And often, not always, but often, it is because we are trying to do the equivalent of drive our life across a flooded road. We are trying to do something in a way for a purpose that we are not designed for or in our relationships, trying to work with our man in a way that he is not designed. If we live in accordance with how we're designed, things will tend to fit. And if not, there will tend to be pain and regret. God does not want us to have that pain and regret. He wants us to work with that design and create a healthy foundation for all that kingdom work that he's called us to do. So what are we doing specifically <clears throat> that is working contrary to how we're designed? Now, there is a whole Bible study on this, right? We're just going to scratch the surface. There's a book called The Life Ready Woman that goes into this in much more detail. <clears throat> So we're just going to scratch the surface on this. But one of the big picture ways that we are trying to operate contrary to how we're designed is that we are trying to have it all. We don't realize it, but we are trying to have it all and do it all and be it all, all at the same time. Because we feel like we should be able to. We're modern women. We're high capacity. You know, no one's going to tell me what I can't do, right? We're <clears throat> We're trying, without maybe thinking of it this way, we're trying to have it all. I, um, when I um, launched my book, The Male Factor, which is about understanding men in the workplace, I launched it on the Today Show a number of years ago, and Meredith Vieira was the one who interviewed me. Do you know, you know who I'm talking about when I say Meredith Vieira, some of you? Okay. So she is, she's an amazing, very professional woman. I really respected her. She, she, was, she was very buttoned up. And I was so intrigued by something that I had seen from her in an interview. And um, there was a series that Time Magazine was doing at the time that they were going to leading women in business and media and Hollywood and so on, okay, people like Meredith Vieira, and they were asking them one question, and it was for a series called the Successful Superwomen series, okay, and they were asking each of them, what do you say to women who want to have it all, okay, and they were getting all these rah, rah, you go girl kind of answers, and most people don't know that before before Meredith Vieira was on the Today Show, many of you know she was on The View, right? Before she was on The View, she was actually one of the primary correspondents for 60 Minutes. And she, this is when, you know, she's married, she, has yo she had young children at the time. And finally she realized, I can't do all this international travel. Like it's one thing to travel domestically, but these international trips to war zones and whatever, I'm gone for weeks, I just can't. I have these young children. And so she went to the producer of 60 Minutes, Steve Hewitt, and she said, I really need to prioritize, you know, my family while my kids are young. Th it just, there's a mismatch here. Can we work something out? So for a little a w while here, where I can do more domestic trips and not as many international ones and have other people assigned to the international ones. And the producer said, I'm sorry, this is the job. Either you do all the international trips we ask you to do or you leave. And she said, Okay, I'll leave. Now, imagine for just a second, 
she, this was this unbelievable opportunity. Imagine how hard that must have been for her to think through, like, is this the end of my opportunities? Right, like, this, it must have been feeling like she was walking away from everything. And yet she did it. And we all now know it wasn't the end, right? She had many more opportunities come up. But at the time, that must have been a pretty tough choice to make. And, and it's interesting. When they asked her that question, what do you say to women who want to have it all, when Time Magazine was doing that series, she said, I hate that expression. Like, you can imagine the interviewer going, huh? Like, she's not answering in the normal way, right? And, and she said, I hate that expression. She said, when I left 60 minutes to focus on my family, I had women who came up to me very angry and said, you know, you were proof that you could have it all. How dare you leave? Wow. Yeah, wow. And, and she said, I thought that was ridiculous that I would lie to myself to create a lie for everyone else. She said, you have to prioritize. If you can fit in a job and a husband and kids and volunteer work and all these other things and be comfortable with it, great. She said, at that point, I realized I couldn't do it and give my kids and my husband what they needed. The idea that we have been brought up with in today's culture, that we should be able to have it all and do it all and be it all, all at the same time, is a myth. We're not designed for that. There may be some way that we can, in some theoretical way, have it all over the course of our lifetime, but we're not designed to be able to do it all at the same time. There are seasons in life and such, as we'll talk about in just a second. If we try to do this, and we're, if it's true, if, if this is true that we're not designed for that, and yet we try to do it, it is, it is very likely that we are going, something is going to break, and we are going to end up with those pain and regrets that we talk, uh, talked about. If it's true, we're not designed for this. In other words, something's going to suffer for it. It may be you that suffers. Like it may be, you know, you have the headaches and the stress, right? It may be your marriage that suffers or your kids. It may be the purposes that God has for your life that suffer. But if it's true that we're not designed for this, something will suffer and we'll have those regrets that God doesn't want us to have. He wants us to design things for the beginning. Now, why, why is it that something in a lot of us rebels against the idea that we can't have it all? Because I know some of you in the room are thinking, yeah, of course not. But some of you in the room are probably, there's a, there's a, uh, that comes up, it certainly was in me when I started realizing what I was seeing in the scripture, right? That this, I feel like I should be able to. This, is ex this was exemplified by, I was doing a women's retreat, very similar to this one. And I was sharing some of these things that we were starting to see. And this one woman comes up to me afterwards. And she was in her early 30s. She was probably, you know, 32, 33 years old. And she is just sobbing, and she is beside herself, and she looks exhausted. And, and she says, I'm not trying to have it all. I'm not. But she's like, I'm just exhausted, and I don't know what to do. And she told me she was a rising star at her workplace. Her boss had her managing these three project teams. She was always working. She had a husband who traveled internationally himself, and they had two little kids who were three and one, I think. And, and she's like, and they're in daycare all the time, and I never see them, and I'm not doing anything well, you know, because that's what happens, right? You don't do anything well. Everybody's unhappy with you. And, um, and, and I said, you know, honey, and <laughs> this is what happens when you're over 45. You can tell somebody who's <laughs> under 35, honey, you can call them that. And I said, honey, honestly, you are trying to have it all. And she's like, I'm not, I'm not, I promise I'm not. And I'm like, okay, let me ask you a question. What is your primary priority now? And I kind of took her off behind a kind of around a corner so we could talk frankly. And I said, let me ask you this honest question. There's nobody else listening. What is your primary priority right now? 
is it your husband and kids or is this a season where you really kind of feel your priority has to be your work? Because I really wanted to know, like, what is her, what is she feeling her primary priority needs to be? I might have an opinion on that, but I'm not her, right? And, and she said, of course it's my husband and kids. Like, yeah, I, I love being the rising star at work, but of course I don't want that to be expense of my marriage. Blah, blah. I said, okay, so you have to make choices. Right now you're not doing anything well. Everybody's upset with you. So if you're going to make choices and you have to prioritize things, this might be a season where you have to tell your boss, you know, I can't manage three project teams. I just can't. This is a season in my life where I can manage one. And she's like, I can't do that, you know. And I'm like, why not? And she's like, because I'm afraid I'm going to miss something. <laughs> and that right there is the cry of so many of our hearts as women. I'm afraid I'm going to miss something. It stirs something deep in us. And you know what? The enemy knows it. Look back at the Garden of Eden and the story of what happened God told Adam and Eve, you can eat any fruit of any of these trees, just not this one. So what does Eve do? She starts obsessing over this one thing that God says not to have. And the enemy comes to her, and what does he say? You're missing something. That's basically what he says. You're missing something. God's holding out on you, right? And instead, imagine the change if she would have realized what we need to realize. If you pull your attention off this one thing that you feel like you're giving up, okay, because that's the way we think of it, that you're giving up, and put it on all this wonderfulness, you'll realize you're not missing something. You're going to find something, that's the way that God has designed us to work. That is where we thrive. When we realize we're not giving up something, we're finding something. It's just, unfortunately, we tend to obsess over what we're being asked to set aside for now. So the key to do here for, for this piece of the puzzle is just start looking at the ways you might, might, be not living according to how you're designed. Are there some of those ways that come up in your, in your mind and heart as you listen to this? So if that is how we're not designed to work, you know, to have it all, do it all, be it all, all at the same time, how are we designed? What's the positive side of this? Okay, what we found biblically is, is that every person, every human being, basically has, if you want to break it down to the most basic level, we have three parts to our design. We have three things that make up our design. Adam and Eve, both, as men and women, made in, you know, every human being made in God's image has what you might call core callings, things that everybody is called to do the way that purposes that we have the design specs. Everybody has certain things. And then every human being is di divided and designed into either men or women with masculine callings and design and feminine callings and design. And so we narrow down. Everybody in this room has that. And then we narrow down even further to personal callings and design. We narrow down to a point our individual talents, our individual gifts, our individual desires, the things that light us up. And it narrows down to that point. And when you find that point you're, where you get to the personal and very individual callings and design, that's where you're going to find God's best for you, which is going to be very different from the woman sitting next to you, right? We're not put into a box, which is one of the things that we as women sometimes rebel against for good reason, because we're not put into a box. We have this individual mandate that God has given us. Now, this is all part of the Fine Balance Bible study. I don't have time to get into all of this, but the key is, as we learn these things, you look at them like a compass. How am I doing in these 
callings and these design in order to get where God wants me to get and make course corrections based on whether you're living that way or not. So we don't, because we don't have time to get into all of them, let's look at the core callings primarily for just a minute. We have essentially, they come from two scriptures in Genesis, and they apply to everybody. And you can actually see, it's fascinating, you can actually see in Genesis 2, is it 2 or 1? Uh, Genesis 1, 28, sorry. You can actually see there's a point where God calls Adam and Eve to himself. And in the ancient Hebrew um, era, the father would often call his children to him and lay a hand of blessing on them and say, go and do this. This is who you are. This is what you're designed for. This is my blessing for you. Very specific. It's fascinating to see that God actually does that with Adam and Eve. And he calls them to himself and he says, this is who you are. Go and do this. Genesis 1.28. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then you see a few verses later in Genesis 2, the man said when he's think, looking at Eve, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she, will, she was taking out, taken out of man. For this reason... A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. So from those two passages, you actually see three very specific core callings emerge that apply to every man and every woman, every human being made in God's images, in God's image. You can actually see these in page 23 on your, in your booklet, by the way. Um, the first is to leave and cleave. Be fruitful. Second is be fruitful and multiply. Third is to subdue and rule. We're going to talk about those really briefly. To leave and cleave is essentially this. We are designed to leave father and mother. We are designed to be our own independent person with our own independent relationship with God, our own character, mature individuals first. And then if we're called to marriage... We are called to cleave to our mate in this super bond that God created called marriage. Second, we're called to be fruitful and multiply. Now, we are designed to essentially raise up and launch a healthy, godly next generation into the world, to be multipliers of people like ourselves who are following after God. Now, this, by the way, is not just have kids, right? That's not what that necessarily means in totality. This is being part of producing and launching those who are going to glorify God and bear his image into the world. And every human being, this is key, every human being is designed for this. Not just women, okay? Some of us have felt like that was a box we were being told to fit into that men aren't. Not true. Adam and Eve were both told this. So we, we, need to, um, we need to recognize every human being is called to this, not just women, it's women and men. And this means every human being is called to this even if they're not married. Every person is called to be part of raising up and launching a healthy, godly next generation um, to, to have people that you pour your lives into. I was writing a book um, in a coffee shop over the course of a couple of months a few years ago where I just needed to get out of the house. There was a lot of stuff going on with the kids and I needed to have some focus time. And so Saturday mornings, I would go to this coffee shop not far from my house and I would sit there for four or five hours and try to get some work done on a book. And I noticed every Saturday morning, there was this woman who came in. She looked like she was maybe in her late 30s and a um, very stylish um, woman. And every Saturday morning, she'd be sitting there waiting. And then a teenage girl would come in, and they would hug, and they would get coffee, and they would sit down and talk. And then the next Saturday, 
another girl would come in and they would hug and get coffee and sit down and talk. And then the next Saturday and the next Saturday and sat. And finally, after like four Saturdays of this, I went up to her and I'm like, I'm sorry, but who are you? <laughs> and what, are, you know, I'm really curious. And she was like, well, I'll be honest. She's like, you know, I'm almost 40 years old. I'd love to be married. God hasn't done that in my life yet. But I found that the girls at church, they tend to view me like a big sister. And there's so many girls that really have, an, have issues that they, for whatever reason they can't, they don't feel like they can necessarily talk to their moms about. And so it's a way for me to be a listening ear. And I thought that is being fruitful and multiplying, right? That's pouring into the next generation in the ways that she was called to. Now, obviously, if you have young kids at home, for example, that's a primary calling for you in those years to be a good steward of that and to shepherd your own children well. So just set that aside for now, but that's just an example of that, okay? Third thing that we're called to, so we've leave and cleave, be fruitful and multiply, subdue and rule. We are designed to and called to advance God's kingdom beyond the home and into the world in accordance with our gifting to accomplish God's kingdom purposes in accordance with our gifting and that in those specific ways. This is perfect example of what it means to be an underground espionage agent in today's world. Let me give you an example of this. So, because it's not always what we think. Hold on a second. Okay, so when we were um, just testing the Fine Balance Bible Study, it used to be called the Life Ready Woman Bible Study, in case any of that confuses you, it's the same thing. So we were testing the Fine Balance Bible Study. There was a church in Atlanta that allowed us to do a, um, a group with about 25 women. They recruited the women from this one church. They were so excited about it, and it was a chance for me to come and teach and sort of test the discussion questions and see how it all worked before we recorded it and published the whole thing, right? And so this one church, it was very sweet, but we showed up, and it was, I think, on Tuesday night, and we showed up for our very first meeting on a Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, and we found that all the church had put out was water. And I'm sorry, but there's something about a women's Bible study that sugar is like a requirement of some kind. Like, there, it's, it's a thing. Like, I'm sure that's in the Bible somewhere, right? That, that you, need, you need food. You need something. And so the next week, it was interesting. There was a woman in the group. Her name, I'll call her Annabelle. And Annabelle somehow, I'm not sure how she did this, but somehow between working a full job that day and arriving at the church at 7 o'clock for the Bible study, she had somehow just whipped up this huge pan of shortbread brownies. And she shows up with this, and everybody's like, oh, you know, and they dive in, and she, you know, she was beaming. Everybody was so excited. Thank you, thank you. She was excited. So the next week, she shows up with, like, berry cobbler, right? The next week, she shows up with cookies or whatever. And every week, she shows up with this, somehow whipping it up. And then the week comes that we're talking about using our gifts and our skills for that eternal perspective, that kingdom eternal perspective. And I'm walking around listening to the discussion groups, listening to people talk, and I hear her say these words. I, this is so discouraging because I just don't have any gifts that can be used for God's kingdom. <laughs> And the woman next to her says, Annabelle, brownies? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, I have the spiritual gift of food. <laughs> and she's like, no, you have the gift of hospitality. And she said, you know, the pastor was telling several of us in the church just last week that so, so much of what we need right now is just people who will invite people home with them after church on Sundays and have lunch with them, invite them over for lunch, you know, basically reach out to them so that there's a development of a community 
development of a, the, the sense that they know a few people. Because he said, the pastor was saying that if people don't feel like they get plugged in and that they know people, they'll be walking right back out the door in just a few weeks. And they really, you know, really want people who can just invite people over. And Annabelle lit up. I mean, her eyes got big. It was really interesting. Her whole demeanor changed. And she said, really? I, I didn't know that that was something that was needed. She's like, I could do that. And the woman next to her said, oh, that sounds exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't her gift. <coughs> See how that works? The woman next to her said, you know, I know that I have gifts that God can use for his kingdom, but I'm not using them. She said, you know, we, she used to work for a ministry and um, they got laid off, a bunch of people got laid off a couple years before. And she said, for the last year and a half, I've been working at Starbucks. And she was 40 years old, she wasn't married. And she said, and I just, I'm working at Starbucks just to pay the bills and have health insurance. And she said, I'm, I'm not using my gifts. And the woman next to her said, Tracy, tell them what happened last weekend. And she started kind of smiling a little bit. And Sunday had been Mother's Day. The, the weekend before had been Mother's Day. And she said, well, yeah, because Lee, I'm by far the oldest person working at Starbucks. Everybody else are these like very worldly 20-year-olds, you know, 25-year-olds. And she said, and these girls, you know, we sit in the break room and we talk and they share their life and they're smoking and going, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have slept with so many guys last week, you know. And... <laughs> And, and, she's, and she's speaking into their life. And she came in for her shift on Sunday, Mother's Day, and there were two Mother's Day cards waiting for her from these two women, young women, who just felt that that was such a way of speaking into their life. And the woman next to her said, oh, that sounds exhausting. <laughs> right? See how that works? There are ways that we are designed and you have been given yours for a reason. You have been given those passions and those gifts and those talents for something that is going to advance God's kingdom purposes. Ephesians 2.10. Let's look at that for a second. Ephesians 2.10. It's one of my favorite verses once I realized what it was actually saying. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Think about that really. I know we've heard that verse, many of us, many times. Think about that in context of what we're saying. We are God's workmanship. The creator is designing us for his purpose and with his designs box, okay? The craftsmaster is designing us. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do specific good works here as underground espionage agents that he prepared in advance from the foundation of the world for us to do. That should blow every one of our minds. But it's also incredibly good news because it means you are designed for not just something. We tend to say you were designed for something. No, you're designed for many things. And you're created the way you are for a very specific reason for something that he prepared in advance for you. There's a Christian philosopher named Frederick Beekner, and he has this fantastic way of summarizing this. He said, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Powerful to think about. The key is to not let life take over. The key is to not be always rush, 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 rush so much that we just get swept up 
and we just don't think about what those purposes are. It's interesting, you know, the devotional out there called Find Rest, which is funny, I saw one of your workshops was called Finding Rest, which all of us need this today. We cover this a little bit in the devotional as well because it is so easy for us to always be rushing that we don't actually purposefully confront this concept of who am I, underground espionage agent, and what am I called to do, and how can I organize my life so I'm living with my design instead of against it. It means that, and the bottom line of this in terms of what we do, here's the key. All of this boils down, really, if we're going to do something about this, all of this boils down to just one thing. We have, we're going to have to make choices. We're going to have to make choices. And this is where we can actually use that compass, this idea of these core callings, feminine callings, personal callings, as a compass to see, am I living according to how I'm designed? And make choices and changes based on it. Let me give you uh, an example of this. So I was, um, this was a number of years ago, the kids were younger, and they were in, um, so they were playing soccer on Saturdays. And I was in Colorado Springs in April recording something, I can't remember what we were recording at the time, but recording something at Focus on the Family, and a blizzard came up, and this was a Friday, and a blizzard sprung up at the end of April. <laughs> what? <laughs> and seriously, and they were, they were expecting two feet of fresh snow over the next 24 to 48 hours. And we were told that my flight, which was on a, it was a Friday afternoon flight as I was supposed to be flying home so that I would be there for the soccer games on Saturday, that they were taking volunteers for people who would be willing to be bumped for the, you know, this kind of last flight out before everything was soft in for a couple of days. They were taking volunteers to be bumped. And I get a call from one of my friends who actually lives in Colorado Springs and she says, Shanti, I heard about the thing where they're asking for volunteers to, you know, stay over for a couple of days. She's like, I have this great idea. And she said, we're going to get two feet of fresh snow. I have a four by four. How about that you volunteer to be bumped and we'll drive up into the mountains tomorrow and we'll go skiing for the next two days on two feet of fresh snow. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. I love skiing. I rarely get to do it, okay? absolutely loved that idea but I was right in the middle of doing this Bible study I was right in the middle of putting this together and I'm like okay let me take some of my own medicine here for a second let me use my situation as a compass how am I doing at the core calling of these th of these three callings okay how am I doing at leave and cleave um, I'm doing okay, actually. I've been learning a lot of stuff about how men think and been trying really to work on that in my marriage. I think, I'm, I think I'm not perfect, but I'm doing better on that. I'm doing okay. How am I doing at the core calling of subdue and rule? How am I doing at that? I think that I'm <laughs> probably doing a lot in that area. I'm always trying to pour into women, trying to pour into couples, doing the research, trying to advance God's kingdom purposes with the books and the ministry that we have. So I feel like I'm doing okay in that area. How am I doing at Be Fruitful and Multiply? Um, I have small children. I'm always on an airplane somewhere. And this is my season for me to be pouring into their lives as a mom myself and trying to raise up a godly next generation in my own home. The compass tells me I really need to focus on this. And so I told my friend, I, I'm so grateful for that invitation, but I'm going to have to take you up on that in about 10 years. Now, let me, let me mention, and by the way, I managed to make it to the airport and flew home and was able to see all the soccer games. But now let me ask, what would have been different if maybe, let's just say for the sake of argument, I was out there for something and I was primarily a stay-at-home mom? What might have been different in my calculus? Doing okay on leave and cleave, doing okay and be fruitful and multiply. I'm really pouring into my kids at this season as a stay-at-home mom. Subdue and rule, 
you know, this friend of mine, she was actually a newlywed, an older newlywed, and she was married to a guy who'd been married before, and they were having some real challenges in their first year, year and a half of marriage, blending, you know, his family and her presence coming in, and there were a lot of issues, and it would have actually been an opportunity for me to go spend a day or two with her kind of doing marriage ministry on two feet of fresh snow. (laughs) 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 But it would have been an opportunity to really speak into her life. My decision might have been different depending on how the compass said I was doing. Do you see how this works? Use this concept to start to guide you to make choices. That is going to be where you find God's best for you. And by the way, let's just remember, put it back to what we were talking about um, last night. Why does this matter? Remember, it's not just so we can live a more balanced life. It's not just so we can thrive in this crazy do-it-all world, although hopefully we will as a result of this. It is because we have been handed these kingdom purposes as underground espionage agents. So whether that is in what we're doing is in what we do for our family, whether it's what we do for the people we work with and how we speak into the lives of those around us or work or whatever, remember, ladies, those of us who have transitioned from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light officially, we've given our life to Christ. Remember, we, have, we are fragile clay jars. We are fragile containers. We contain a great treasure that we can share with others. Think through that concept that Frederick Buechner said of the place that God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Start thinking about that. Where is that? What does that look like for you? And wh- what, ha- what is it that you're doing that God hasn't given you the grace for? That maybe because you're trying to do it, you're not able to fill this other kingdom purpose that God has asked you to do. Now, I would also just mention, and I, I, didn't, I didn't tell Linda I was going to do this. I sort of, I hope this is okay. I, I also want to challenge each of us. There may be people in the room who realize that they have never transitioned themselves out of the kingdom of darkness. They may realize, there may be some of you who say, I've never really officially done that. I've never accepted this amazing sacrifice that Jesus made for me. And I want to be part of the kingdom of light. So I just want to end with just praying here and let's all just pray and I would ask if you realize I'm kind of in that maybe I'm on the fence maybe I've never really realized I had to actually officially do this I would ask you to just take a minute while we're praying and tell the Lord that this is what you want to do with your life you may have maybe you've given God your mind but you realize you've never given him your heart okay like we were talking about the other, the other way around. So let's just end by stopping and praying. And for those of us who are in the kingdom of light, reaffirm that we are going to be part of what God has said for us, okay? Lord, um, Lord Jesus, I am so, so grateful for these women who are coming here to seek your face. And we come before you, Lord, knowing that you are good and also knowing that you have sacrificed yourself for us so that we do not need to be trapped in the kingdom of darkness. We do not need to live as those who are perishing. You have rescued us. Lord, for those of us who are in here, if there's anyone in here who's never really made that transaction, never really said, I give my life to you. Lord, help them to know that they don't need to have it all figured out, that they don't need to know exactly how it all works, but if you are tugging on their heart, it is because the Father is drawing them. 
And so right now, if you're in that position, just tell the Lord, I accept you. Save me. Transfer me from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. I want to be your child. I accept what you have done for me in dying and being raised again from the dead so that I can live for you and with you forever. Lord, we are so grateful to be your children. We are so grateful that in this dark world, you have given us kingdom purposes. We are so grateful, Lord, that the place that you call us is the place where our deep gladness and the world's deep, deep hunger meet. Help us to live in that place as we are called. Amen.